Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 147. I'm really thrilled to bring you this conversation with Lily Ehrman, who is an incredibly inspiring, joyful and fun nature communicator that I've been following for some time now. Lily is an educator specializing in the field of biomimicry. She has a deep curiosity about nature and a passion for helping others to see the wonders all around us. In our conversation, we talked about what biomimicry is and how it helps us to tap into solutions to design questions in all different fields and how looking to and learning from nature can offer hope for the future. Let's listen. Lily, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I am stoked to be here. I've been wanting to chat to you ever since I came across you online because you have such an amazing way of presenting nature with this childlike sense of excitement and wonder and I just adore your way of expressing that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been so fun to explore that space online and to really find folks who resonate with it. I think we are all nature and connecting to nature in so many different ways all the time. And I like that term childlike because even though we use that term, it's always in us. Yes. We always have that wonder and that curiosity. It just gets stifled sometimes by the, you know, everyday workload, the stress, overwhelming things that happen in our lives, but it's always there. We just have to learn how to tap into it. Absolutely. And did you have that same sense when you were a child? Has nature been part of your life from the beginning? Yes, it definitely has. I actually vividly remember not enjoying hiking when I was young (laughs) or like feeling at least a few times that my parents were kind of like dragging us outside. And maybe this one I was, this is when I was older, but I grew up um, in California in the Bay area And my mom was a big wildflower gal and my dad was always just out exploring and wanting to hike and adventure with us. Um, And they both worked really hard to get us outside a lot, which I um, now recognize what a crucial part of my development that was and how I really want to do that for my future children. But yeah, my dad was, um, you know, as a reward for getting good grades, for example, in middle school. Uh, he would take me on backpacking trips. And that's just such a beautiful memory I have. And then every spring break as a family, we would take our old uh, Toyota Land Cruiser and trailer and drive south from the Bay Area to the Mojave Desert or Anza Borrego and just try to find all the different wildflowers that my mom had marked up in her books. And they just (laughs) made that experience so fun for us. Um, And I just think it slowly sunk in how incredible nature is and how we need to appreciate it and and explore it. Yeah. What a beautiful gift they gave you. Yeah. And it set you on this trajectory. And so you finished high school, you studied environment at university and then went on to study biomimicry, which has become your life. And I'd love to hear that story about, did you always know that you wanted to go into this field? Did you fall into it? How did it happen? That's a good question because I actually have not always been into the environmental studies, biomimicry space. In fact, when I started even college, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I Mm -hmm. started off um, with a lot of biology and um, genetics and organic chemistry and all of these like heavy pre-med basically pathway classes. And at the same time, I was starting to get into at UC Santa Cruz the Student Environmental Center. I won an internship, um, like the chance, I forget what it's called, Chancellor's Undergraduate Internship, where they match you with a student organization. And so I worked for a year with the Student Environmental Center. And I actually have Joyce Rice to thank, who was our um, staff member for the Student Environmental Center, who brought us, me and I think one or two other students from the Student Environmental Center, to Bioneers. 
in 2012, 2013, I think it was. And Bioneers is a conference in the Bay Area, which is an incredible place to go if you're in any of these spaces. And it was the first time I was really exposed to biomimicry, but there were some student teams, I think, that had won the design challenge or were in the final um, design challenge. And they were announcing the winners of the design challenge for biomimicry and this idea that folks were creating and learning from nature and that was people were doing it, I think was just really impactful, especially because as I was getting into the environmental space, I felt really frustrated and Mm -hmm. overwhelmed and honestly pretty depressed at the state of our world and my ability to have an impact on it. And that I think just um, clouded a lot of the hopefulness uh, that I had at the time as an undergraduate. And going to this conference and learning about biomimicry and seeing it done and just being in a space with thousands of other people who are excited about Mm -hmm. biomimicry and indigenous knowledge and environmental um, studies and this like hopeful narrative that, you know, we did get ourselves into a huge challenging space where we're going to have to radically adapt in order to uh, align with what, what we're going to be experiencing in the next hundred years and folks are already experiencing, but nature's already solved for so many of the same Mm. challenges that we can learn from and has been designing for and solving those challenges for millions, if not billions of years And we can tap into that collective knowledge and that hopeful and humbling, right? Like, oh, we actually don't have all the solutions. Yes, yes. That narrative really changed everything for me. It was just so powerful, I think, to like have that light switch just flicked so quickly. Like, oh, it is, uh, you know, we do need to acknowledge the facts and it is heart wrenching what we're going to have to adapt to and what folks are facing right now as far as climate chaos. But this idea that we actually can turn to nature and as a, you know, mentor, as a model, as inspiration and learn from that and, and model based off of that was, yeah, it was really a game changer. Absolutely. I wonder if you can go back and give a simple explanation of what biomimicry is for those who haven't come across the concept yet. Yes. Biomimicry is an ancient practice. People have been learning from nature um, since they've been people on this planet. But in the last 50, 75 years, it's really been coined more in academia and the written kind of world and more of a methodology has been put into place for learning from nature's forms, processes, and systems to design life-friendly products or uh, companies or even on large scale like buildings or cities. This, this idea that we can learn from nature and nature's had a lot of time to refine those designs. And as Janine Benya says, one of my favorite quotes from hers is failures are fossils and what surrounds us is the secret to our survival. And I really believe that. Yeah, this is, this is an incredible thing. And I think that the, I, you use the word humbling and I think that that's a wonderful thing for us as a species because we have this view of being in control or on top in some way and to realize not only uh, has nature done it before but that we can learn from nature is is a wonderful thing and that you said that it can counterbalance it can counteract this sense of hopelessness that we've that we've somehow irreparably damaged the world that we can get that sense of hope is is what we need, I think, because that sense of debilitating worry can can stop us from progressing. Yeah, and I'm still, you know, I'm still navigating that. I think it's going to be mm. part of our future. But mm. this field and this practice of turning to nature, building a deeper relationship with nature, and then creating a world where we can live in harmony with nature is, in my opinion, and some other people's opinions, <laughs> the most powerful pathway, I think, for our future, this idea of bio-inspired design, biomimicry, and learning from nature. So it is my entire career right now, just sharing about <laughs> it and getting people excited about it. And I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so part of that, part of your work, you do uh, 
is sharing it online through your platform, Lily Learns from Nature. I think this is just so, so delightful. And I, in watching you, it really is about noticing, isn't it? It's about spending enough time or slowing down enough to notice what's around you. Yeah, totally. And just appreciating not only these like epic views that people hike to yeah. and they get – you know, clocking their miles and seeing like in Colorado here, like how many 14ers can you do in a season? And (laughs) I respect that. And I'm here for it. And I want to support people that want to challenge themselves physically, but at the same time, having a relationship with nature and deepening that respect and honoring all that nature is and our connection to nature is so much more than just the vistas and the views. And so I think that's really what I've been kind of honing in on my niche on online is, and people are really relating to it, which is why like some of these videos that I've been making have been going viral. And I love that because it just shows that those people are out here and in the comments, they're always like, Oh my God, this is me too. And they're making friends maybe in their area. It's, it's a cool space. (laughs) That is so excellent. And at at the end of uh, many of your videos, you have the tagline nature is so cool. And I just think that that is fabulous for yeah like you say getting people excited about it or sharing their excitement or or putting it out there like it's okay to be a nature nerd it's okay to feel like excited about this stuff yeah totally and I mean we could go down a philosophical rabbit hole (laughs) with (laughs) with this maybe that I'm gonna bring up but the idea that actually that we are nature and it's not something separate is something I really like to talk talk about as well And while I think my socials don't really get into that, the idea of just like going out and looking at one bug for half an hour or admiring the mushrooms or like on natural history field quarter, I think I spent six hours watching a cicada emerge from its exoskeleton and like do its shedding and become like a full adult. And it was the coolest experience. And it was just like, watching it kind of like shimmy out and then just wait there for an hour and then shimmy out and then its wings come out. It was incredible. Maybe it was a dragonfly now that I'm remembering it because the wings definitely came out full and were like these big wings. It was a dragonfly. It was so cool. And I just, (laughs) this idea that like we're separate from nature has really only been in the last couple hundred years of the industrial revolution. And I think a lot of folks don't even can't even access that relationship because it's been, they've been so separate from it for so long. And yeah, the idea that we can just go out in our backyard onto the patio around the block, wherever, even if you're in a heavily urbanized area, the weeds in the sidewalk crack, the birds that are flying ahead, the pigeons, the rats, they're all well adapted and we can all like admire and appreciate, you know, what they have to offer in the ecosystem. And we are part of the ecosystem. So that's, a soapbox that I will maybe not spend too much time on, but hopefully getting to this deeper idea in my social media and in a lot of the stuff that I do, like, yes, going out and appreciating nature is cool. But even the idea that we have to say nature, like go out into nature is like, well, we actually, everything is nature, right? Yeah. I I'm 100% behind this idea. And it's interesting because there's lots of studies to show that we are healthier in mind and body when we're outside, that connecting with nature helps us, benefits our, our, us in every way. And that shouldn't be surprising, but because this is, this is our home, this is what we are, this is our system, this is our, this is us. And, yeah. and it shouldn't surprise us, but it does. We are... I think if like we're going to flip that and I've heard this and it's definitely like lowers anxiety, lowers stress, increases Mm -hmm. creativity, increases well-being, even increases like our immune systems. And there's there's so many research um, studies that point to that. And even that one that was in the early 90s, late 80s, where they studied hospital patients recovering who had a view of a green space and who didn't. And those who had the view of the green, even just a a view outside of a tree healed faster. And I think there's a lot of power in that. And somebody said, I think this is even on social media. I forget which account posted this, but she did a voiceover and basically was saying we link nature connection to being healthier, but it's actually Mm -hmm. 
inherently we are healthy when we're out in nature. It's being in buildings and our everyday environment Mm -hmm, and being in front of a screen that's actually not healthy for us. And so like flipping that script, I think is really powerful. Like actually that's where we're supposed to be (laughs) evolutionarily. Right. And outside spending as much time as possible learning about our ecosystems, connecting with each other, building community, being in relation with, I think is really powerful. And yeah, yeah, only the last couple of hundred years have we really distanced ourselves from that intentionally and non-intentionally. And there's a lot of things at play for that distancing, but that's what I'll say about that. And it's, yeah, it's inherently healthy for us to be outside and being inside in front of screens and most of our everyday life activities are are what's causing damage. <laughs> that is a really interesting way to flip it. And and I what comes up for me is watching my son as a parent. He's he's 7 years old and he likes a screen as much as any kid and I you know encourage him to be away from the screen for most of the day uh but i notice when he's engaged in play outside just how calm he is just how happy he is just how present he is in a way that when we're inside his catch cry is i'm bored i'm bored and the solution in his mind for being bored is the screen but th- he doesn't say that when we're outside yeah i work for a nonprofit here Um, they're based in Boulder, the Kiva center. And I run their Denver after school programs where we get kids outside and they have a homeschool program that's entirely outdoor based, um, up near Boulder and kind of this Canyon wooded area with a river going through it. And a lot of kids go up there just to be outside and Mm. connect to nature in new ways. And our mentors, you know, teach them foraging and survival skills. And there's a lot of just like games and activities that are community building in kind of a very informal space. Like let's just have fun outside. But the outcomes that we see related to that, especially around mental health, Mm. it's, yeah, it's really (laughs) mind-blowing, pun intended. Yeah, it is striking, isn't it, to see the difference in yeah. In, in not just kids, adults as well. Yeah. Or sometimes I give um, nature journaling workshops to l- a group that f- is very high energy and, and I've thought to myself, how, uh, how are these kids going to sit still for this activity? And, and yet when it's time, everyone is deeply focused, everyone's heads are down or looking around and the, this hush comes down over the group. It's quite amazing. Yeah, I... I've found the same, even with just myself sitting in front of a screen, you know, I teach online the majority of my week and I love it. It means I can teach people from all over the world, but then after like close it, I'm like, okay, I need to go outside. And then I pretty instantly feel so much better. Even just walking around the neighborhood, we have some neighborhood Cooper's Hawks that like to fly and sit in all the trees. And so I'll kind of keep tabs on them and all the different flowers or seeds that are kind of out right now, which are very few, but the evergreen trees, the pine cones, it's all, even in an urban area, it's its there. And just being out in it is, yeah, really helpful for my mental and physical well-being for sure. Mm-mm-mm. As part of your posts online, you have this really sweet joke, which is about what it's like to go hiking with you. And I'd love for you to describe that to the listener, what it's like to go hiking with Lily. Okay. It is, <laughs> but we're not going to get very far. <laughs> I usually set out, in fact, I've gotten really good in the last couple months of finding trails where I know there'll be very few people so I can spend (laughs) as much time as possible crawling or crouching and to try to get a better look at the (laughs) bugs and the plants and the bark and the mushrooms. And even right now, which is not the dead of winter, we're coming out of it now in Colorado, but Mm. it's still winter and there's so much out there still. I think people have this assumption that in winter, everything's going to be hibernating or dormant or migrating away. Mm-hmm. And while that's somewhat the case, it's there's also so much to see and so many interesting adaptations that we can see that are adapted to cold. And, uh, you know, I just made that video about pine cones and how they change shape with water and just this idea of like <laughs> crawling on the floor, like becoming a little forest gremlin, <laughs> just like rolling around and like in the moss, laying in the moss and look at, looking at the birds or just listening to them and not even knowing their names, but looking them up later. 
My yeah. backpack is full of identification books and nature journals and watercolors and heavy binoculars that sometimes I don't even use, but I carry on most hikes anyway. Yeah, we're we're going to be stopping every couple seconds and asking a lot of questions, potentially journaling for a little bit. I have a blast and I'm so glad that my husband is is really patient. But I have led a couple hikes with other folks in this kind of nature nerd space and it's so fun because all of yes. us are just like <laughs> everyone's out on the ground. Everyone's looking at all the things. <laughs> And pointing things out, like some people will be really good at plant identification. Some people really yes. know their birds. And so it's cool to bring everyone together and just nerd out. And I think we made it, which was impressive, maybe like two miles on one of the guided hikes. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best. That is so good. So when you go out, what is your mindset? You know, you have this idea or this sense that nature is so cool. I'm wondering when you go out, are you looking – for curious things are you just in the sense of open curiosity are you looking for mysteries or are you just sort of taking it all in that's a really interesting question and I'm not sure how I would answer it I think a lot of the time especially when I'm hiking with other people we are in general hiking to a destination Mm -hmm. you know if I'm backpacking I am trying to make it to the lake so there's a place to set up a tent or whatever that may be Um, and we intentionally choose places that aren't too far. Like, I don't think I've done any crazy hikes, but often the questions I'm asking that are kind of bringing up new ideas for me are how did this get the way that it is? And Mm. I love posing that question to my undergraduate students when they do nature journaling, because it then prompts more questions, right? Of why is this thing the way it is? Why is it the shape that it is? Why does it have the surface coating that it does? You know, if it's a bird or a bug or something, why is it behaving in this way? And then it's like, what is its food source? What are its predators? How is it connected to the ecosystem? And even like, what are some abiotic or biotic selection pressures? Mm -hmm. Like, how did it, why did it adapt to get the way that it is? Those are a lot of the questions that I'm asking when I'm out hiking, because that will bring up especially for biomimicry, right? Like what can we learn from or how is this organism adapted to its habitat and kind of how could we translate that or learn from that for our own world? But most of the time, you know, I'm I'm just being in awe. Sometimes I'm not Mm. even worried about what plant or what mushroom. I'm really bad with mushrooms, for example. I know maybe like four or five mushrooms, like the generic group, but not specific species. I'll just be like, whoa, <laughs> that's, yeah. that looks really cool. And then maybe they'll prompt questions <laughs> like, what, what is it doing? Like, why is it like that? But 90% of the time, or maybe not 90, like 75% of the time is just like, whoa, that's really cool. Let's just spend a little time yeah. admiring this and like being with it for a second with, rather than just like continuing to march on the trail and yeah, yeah. just try to make it to point A or to point B. I have this sense that nature observation nature connection and nature journaling it helps us just live in this constant state of wonder because the world is ridiculously amazing and I mean we live in this body this vessel that all is like millions of intricate happenings are going on inside us every second and that's incredible in itself but then we look out at this world and it's easy, I, maybe it's some sort of functional, it's some sort of adaptation to help us get through the day or whatever it is. The, but we have this ability to block it out. But when you get practiced at it or when you sort of switch on your curiosity, we have the ability just to be totally amazed. And like you said, it doesn't have to be out in the Grand Canyon or somewhere grand it can be in your backyard but that ability to be amazed is something that you can build on I think yeah I like to say cultivating a curiosity I think that's healthy Mm -hmm. and you mentioned right at the beginning this childlike wonder and childlike curiosity and if we can learn how to tap into that at every age I think our world will be a radically different place and I think nature journaling is a key practice for that. I love nature journaling for that reason. And it brings me back to this like almost other 
othering, like I'm beyond myself, right? I'm Mm, mm. looking at these little bugs interacting or the butterflies that are trying to mate or, you know, bees that are pollinating. And I'm, I'm thinking about the world, not just from my perspective, but that bee's perspective or the butterfly's perspective. And yeah, that is really calming and also like really hopeful to be in that place of, I'm not just trying to work or trying to do, you know, my tasks for the day. I'm just sitting here for an hour or two, maybe more if I'm lucky. And I'm just observing. I'm just watching. I'm just being in this space. You know, I found my spot to sit. Maybe I'm noticing if I'm lucky, there's like a fox that walks by or an owl that comes to perch. And then I'm immersed for another hour. I think Annie Dillard writes about that really beautifully. And Robin Wall Kimmerer who I was so yes. lucky to have lunch with a few years ago. Really? And yeah, I was at the Natural <laughs> History Confluence in 2019, I want to say. And she was one of the keynotes. And it was a pretty small space in Arizona from the Natural History Institute. And she was she was there and I was volunteering. And I just sat down for lunch. And then I, I, there was a chair open and she came and sat with me. I was like, oh my God, what? keep your cool. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, yeah, Tell she was just that. as wonderful. What did you talk about? Did, what did you talk about at lunch? Oh, that's a good question. I don't remember. I think did, it was did just yeah, like come up? our time in Arizona, what yeah. we were up to, how things are going. Gosh, I tried not to yes. fangirl too much. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> uh, but she's she's just as wonderful as you would um, expect. And as you imagine. Mm-hmm. The way that she relates and speaks about that relationship to nature, I think, is really important for I it's my first book I recommend to anybody when they say they want to get into nature and close second it was my first until I had read Robin's book but um, including gathering moss braiding sweet grass is the big one but gathering moss Mm. is a really popular Mm. one it's a short read and she talks about moss and bryophytes in a really cool way but Annie Dillard did this um, and has a, a lot of books but my favorite is Pilgrim at Tinker Creek where she just spends a whole year on Tinker Creek, where she, I think she has a cabin, um, and she just observed the muskrats and the birds. And it, she just writes about that experience. And it was so beautiful. I took it on Natural History Field Quarter when I was in college. And it was a really beautiful read because, yeah, she writes about the natural world at the level that I aspire to. <laughs> I think probably <laughs> never, but... I'm like, wow. It, yeah, just even when you're sitting in your living room reading it, it feels like you're out on the river with her and learning and appreciating nature. It's cool. I love that about really good nature writing. It transports you to that place. Yeah. I find that with the writing of Robert McFarlane, who's a, a British nature writer, and it just transports you to that place. Yeah. Mm-mm. It's it's a cool skill to have. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me more about your nature journal practice because you – uh, you touched on it, but I'd love to hear how you how you came to it, what it means to you, and how you go about it. I started nature journaling in college, um, and it was actually for an assignment as part mm. of Natural History Field Quarter, which is a pretty unique UC Santa Cruz tradition where you spend an entire quarter traveling around California to different ecosystems uh, with wow. 25 other students, like camping at research stations. And staying at research, like it's pretty remote on University of California reserve, natural reserves. We went to the Mojave Desert and then we went to Santa Cruz Island and then we went to the South Fork Eel River and then we went to the Eastern Sierras near Mono Lake and we took our field journal with us everywhere and we learned about different ecosystems and we were learning about plants and animals and birds the whole time with other students who were excited about nature and professors and instructors who were really knowledgeable. And it was transformative. It was life changing. Mm. I had already been interested in biomimicry. And then this idea of like tuning into nature's systems and cycles and relationships really made that practice of biomimicry that much deeper. And so I was, I really connected with nature journaling I was terrible at it. I think I have it actually right here. You know, this was my whole natural history field quarter oh, journal. Well, and it's, amazing. I think it gets better, but it's, it's like we're out in the field. Sometimes it's pretty rushed. It's a lot of like plant ID with the Jepson. Mm-hmm. If you're familiar with plant IDs and the Jepson is like this big, huge book. So we had to lug around with us. 
Okay. And yeah, not always the most detailed drawings, but some really beautiful insights. Oh my God. This was the page about watching the dragonfly come out. (laughs) No way. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. So this is where it started. Natural History Mm -hmm. Field Quarter. Yeah. Where we were graded on our nature journal. This is what we, the only thing we had to turn in really. And I was not, and still am not, I wouldn't say like a professional artist or like, I don't consider myself an artist, but I do enjoy it. And I think that's the key there. And I'm sure you have things to say about people not calling themselves (laughs) artists, (laughs) but that's where it started. And it meant so much to me. And it was so kind of meaningful in that way of like, okay, Mm -hmm. taking it a step further when you're connecting to nature. Um, I don't even think I got like all A's on that, on that because it was just like, I missed some key components, but I had fun with it. And it really, yeah, it really connected to biomimicry in important in an important mm-hmm. way for me. And so that's where it started. I have, I'll be honest, not been the most consistent nature journaler over the years. Um, and I would say that was about 10 years ago now, eight years ago, uh, Natural History Field Quarter. But I take it with me on hikes pretty casually if I'm, especially if I'm solo hiking, which mm-hmm. I cherish those moments, right? Like going into nature just by myself. Usually I'll bring my dog because I feel guilty <laughs> leaving him at home. But I'll find a if place where walking, he can be off If you're walking, he should leave. be walking. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, I do it for fun. Um, you know, sometimes I'll feel more abstract and just do something that comes to my heart. Sometimes I'm actually drawing like a specific kind of lichen or a specific plant. I don't think I've ever drawn a bird. <laughs> Because I, it's like not something that really speaks to me, but maybe I should take one of your classes and get better at drawing birds because I, I <laughs> never draw on a bird. <laughs> I birds like identifying birds. Because they, they move very quickly and often drawings that you see in people's journals are drawn from uh, photos that they've found online of a bird that they've seen rather than in the field. That's a tricky That one. makes me feel better. And I think I yeah. have heard that, especially <laughs> maybe on field quarter, they were like, don't try to do it. They try to get a picture or just look in the, the Sibley guide and, yeah. and draw from that. <laughs> <laughs> I but love yeah. well, you're handling the, you're, you're holding the, the book now, your original nature journal, and it's just some pages that maybe were torn out of a journal that are um, bound together with a ring. And it's, it's not precious. I mean, it is precious, but it's not, um, it's not, uh, what what am I trying to say? It's not a perfectly bound, expensive watercolor journal. It's 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 to be used and it's to be taken out with you in the field. Yeah, and this was actually part of a journal um, that you can bound, you can bind and unbind. Ah, okay. Which I really okay. actually recommend for folks who are getting started because Mm-mm. you can do this. Where you, I think it was protected when I was in the field, or at least yep. most of the time. And then I think to maybe use this again, I just took all of the pages out and bound it. This is potentially not the best way to preserve this. It could fall apart. And you can see it's like stained with coffee. And- <laughs> yes, that's the way it should be. My, my journals, because I use my journals as a teaching aid. My, some of my drawings have like a footprint on them, for example, yeah. if I put them out <laughs> and someone's walked over it. Yeah. They're, they're treasures, but they're also to be used, I think. And yeah. I love seeing that because it, it shows that you were out there and not not getting caught up in the in the details, but just getting it all down, everything that was coming into you, all the experiences were going down on the page. Yeah, and so wonderful. Like even just right now, I'm just like emotional yeah. thinking about this experience yeah. because I get to look back and yeah. see where I was at eight years ago and read about the things I saw and where I was and the people I was with. And it's, yeah, Mm. it's, it makes me really emotional. It's really beautiful. And I Mm -hmm. love it so much. And I, yeah, definitely like there's been years. I have want to say like three more nature journals since then. I finally got Mm -hmm. one that has watercolor paper (laughs) because I do, (laughs) I remember, I I realize that it does matter if you, if you want to do watercolor consistently to have some paper, that's good for it. But I can look back and, you know, some, some years again are more detailed, like last year, I think I journaled three times. I was planning a wedding and we were moving into a new house and doing house projects. And that looked a little different for nature journaling, but I have like three entries and they're all going to be remembered very fondly when I look back on them in 25, 40 years, you know? 
Absolutely. And your children will go and look at those and treasure them and know what you did back in the day and all those things that they're seeing in nature. They'll see your experiences of of those things. Yeah. And yeah, that makes me smile really big. And I recently, when I was at in, uh, in the Bay Area at home for the holidays, found journals from my great, great grandfather. And they're not nature journals there. I think yeah. cattle journals. <laughs> so a very different kind of journal, but I am treasuring them. They're yes. so cool. Like 1880 something. And he wow. actually like a town in Colorado is named after him. Cause I guess he started it. Um, he, or I shouldn't say started it. He's a white colonizer. <laughs> I'm sure he had to kick some indigenous people out, which it makes my past problematic, but I'm learning a lot about it. And it's really cool to have that history and, and be able to learn about it and dive into that in a very visceral way like these old yes gold edged journals from the late 1800s mid 1800s wow. i think late 1800s and we have like 60 of these little journals and you know they're mostly for cattle tracking and how many heads of whatever he has but sometimes it'll be like went to denver like the snow was bad today and the handwriting is that old like late 1800s handwriting it's hard really to read cool. yeah. yeah yeah that's amazing that that reminds me of an experience that i had recently which is that um uh, my my father passed away last year and that was really hard. But when my aunt came up for his memorial, she brought with her a memory stick and on it was 500 photographs of my grandmother, my paternal grandmother's artworks. And mm. I knew she was an artist, but I'd never seen her work. And a lot of it was nature. A lot of it was landscapes or very detailed things you know exactly what I'm doing with my life and my time and Mm -hmm. just that um seeing her brush marks seeing her watercolors seeing the things that she decided were important enough to put on the page and yeah those those strokes or seeing her writing it was it was very moving and it connected me to her I didn't know her I met her when I was young but um I don't have memories of her and and it, but it felt very much like this, this lineage through my father who had passed away to his mum, and and this idea of, um, yeah, just that that pres- preserving of that person's um, life and memories and the things that they thought were important enough to write down and draw. Yeah, it, it's significant. It's really significant and mm. special, especially after you lose somebody and you're able mm. to look back mm. on those you know, part of their past, who raised them, who was part of their life. I think that's really beautiful. I'm also really sorry to hear about your dad. I remember you posting that on socials and Mm. yeah, I also lost my dad. Um, It was many years ago now when I was 17. So 11 years ago, 12 years ago, Mm. but we recently, same trip when we looked at the journals from my great, great grandfather, when I was home for the holidays, I found some of his lecture notes. And so, yeah, he wasn't a journaler, but he was a professor of economics, and so he has these really detailed, handwritten, like tiny little writing lecture yeah. notes, and you know a lot of mathematical equations that I have no idea what mm-hmm. they are. But I took a binder just because I want to, you know, remember him in that way. And mm-hmm. I think we're going to get a couple framed that kind of look good together. But yeah, it's it's really special to mm. to have that, especially as you're navigating grief and everything. Yes. Oh, that gives me goosebumps. Yeah. Con- continuing talking about family, you just recently had a wedding. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Zoomed a lot of me, my time. <laughs> <laughs> but it seemed to me like watching you from a distance, it seemed like every part of that experience and that tradition was steeped in nature or nature guided that. Tell yes, me about for that. for sure. <laughs> we got married outside in the mountains with all of our most of our family and friends and mm. it was so beautiful and I don't like the word perfect but it was really yeah. clo- it was yeah. perfect for us yeah we loved it and it was yeah out it was definitely windy we were at the mercy of the elements and it was in October in the Rockies so we were at like 10,000 feet during the ceremony wow. and it did decide to be windy but Everyone was a trooper and it was just beautiful. And then the sun came out at the very end and it was warm and it was, yeah, it was beautiful. And then the reception was inside, but just being able to 
see all our friends and family because they're all in different areas. You know, we live, I don't want to say isolated, but we chose to live in Colorado where none of our family Mm. lives very intentionally because we love nature and want to be close to nature and Mm. skiing and backpacking and all that. But it was special to have them all travel pretty far to come hang out with us. And we got married at the YMCA which meant that everybody could stay there, like in cabins or the lodges. Oh, fantastic. And then we were just kind of walking around this big summer camp, really, um, all weekend. And so <laughs> we had fun. an event on Friday, we had an event on Sunday, and people would yep. just come to this big cabin that we were at and see us consistently over the course of a couple of days. And that was really special. That's beautiful. Tell me a bit more about your landscape. So you talked about moving to Denver so that you can be near nature. What does, what does the landscape look like? like around you? Well, I am looking out over the front range right now from my office. So that's why I keep looking up because I have a view of the mountain (laughs) lines. Um, We're near Denver. So Denver's in the plains. Everyone thinks Denver's in the mountains. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But it is on flat prairie ground. There are prairie dogs and yucca and the Denver area. Like you can see the mountains, but there are good hour from Denver, probably like solid hour without traffic. And there's often traffic, Okay, <laughs> but we're kind of halfway between the mountains and Denver. Um, cause we wanted to be close to the city, but not in the city because there is a lot of traffic to get out of Denver when yep. you want to go anywhere on the weekend. Um, so we're kind of in the front range foothills, not really in the mountains, probably around 5,700 feet. I want to say um, you know, they they called Denver the Mile High City, so we're maybe a little higher than that, but pretty <laughs> pretty much the same as Denver. Near Golden, which has these kind of like big flat top plateaus, um, but very like mix of desert and mountains. Mm. I was just on a hike mm. this past weekend, and there were yuccas and cactuses next to the junip- junipers and the pine trees, and it felt very like, I don't know how to describe it, like merging of ecosystems, mm. which was really mm. cool. That sounds like an incredible landscape. When you present, you know, your videos online, you you share information about a really wide range of subjects. Some, sometimes people specialize in birds or they specialize in moss or whatever it is, but you seem to dive into so many different subjects. And I'm wondering about your process for learning about these things. How do you dive into like gathering information and researching that sort of thing? I consider myself a generalist. I, mm-hmm. my goal in life is to just have as many random little facts <laughs> about <laughs> as many things as possible. And I definitely am not an expert on any of them <laughs> intentionally, right? Like I love yeah. my most recent season on my podcast, Learning from Nature. Is I kind of dove deep with scientists, biologists, people who really knew a lot about hexagons or, mm-hmm. you know, honeybee, honeycomb. And that was really cool because it scratched this itch for me. It was like, oh, I know a little bit about honeycomb and like why honeybees are cool, but let's get as specific as possible and like really dive into corner radius or whatever it may be, you know, that I had no idea about, but folks spend their entire lives researching one thing. And I'm definitely the opposite, but I love being curious about something random in nature. I have heard, like, for example, my most recent video on pine cones changing shape, Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that they, you know, kind of change shape with humidity, but I had never seen it with my own Mm. eyes really. And Mm. I was like, I wonder how quickly that happens or if it happens for all pine cones, even after they've been on the ground for months or years, turns out they all do, they all change shape and there's nothing to do with if they're, you know, still attached to the tree or not. And I just got some wet and took a time lapse. And it was so cool to just like experiment and play and be in this creative space of like, I have no idea what's going to come of this, but I know I want to, you know, learn about this. And I did some online research and kind of found out why, like what the mechanism of that is, what kind of tissues are responsible, what happens when they get wet. Um, and then, you know, writing it kind of and digesting it enough that I can explain it in under a minute. It can be really tricky sometimes, (laughs) but it's a, it's a fun challenge that I love because as a nature communicator, I think there's a lot of folks in like the science communication space. Maybe I fit into that, but I'm almost like a little further out where I'm just like, I want to be general enough and not even really get into, Hmm. well, I shouldn't say that because I definitely get into the science of things. Um, But just being this kind of blanket, more generalized explainer. And I love that. Like 
the other video before the pine cones was another changing shape seed from the mountain mahogany plant, which I had heard again, just from being in conversation with botanists and biologists over the years, that there are certain seeds that kind of can drill themselves into the ground. And I thought it was only this Areogonum species of storksbill, because that's the video I'd seen online. And so I saw the mountain mahogany seed had a very similar shape with little hairs. And I was like, oh, this looks like it might change shape with humidity. So again, I brought some back home, got them wet, and instantly, like within a second or two, oh. they were straightening out. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And so I took some videos of that and like really dived into why that is and how it happens and got so excited because I had, I had never seen it before. And then I get to share that with other people and ex- like, you know, showcase how cool nature is and not only talk about how cool nature is, but like, why is it cool? I think that's where I like to play in my social media space. Like here's a viral video that's silly and not very descriptive. And then you get on my page and you're like, oh, look at these cool, more in-depth videos. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the videos that I spend a lot of time on are the more educational pieces. And then the ones that are like 10 seconds always go viral. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I know what the <laughs> internet wants. And I, I do do a little of that. But the goal <laughs> is to get them on my page so we can learn more about nature and not just think nature is cool, but figure out why. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. That's an interesting thing. And it... it I love that you experiment, that you actually physically take the things and change it and observe. And it re- reminds me of something that I did a while back, which was that I noticed in this particular stand of grass, this little crop of grass that I had, that when the grass blades were broken, everything below the break was red instead of green. And I thought, is it what's going on here is it this particular grass is it that the chlorophyll is somehow degrading after the break what's going on so I went around and I um tagged some of the stems that were broken and then I deliberately bent some more and then I went to a different species and I bent those and I watched them over time and I I still don't know the answer but the the process was really fun and and I'm wondering about your thoughts on you know because being in nature can bring up heaps of questions. And when you were talking before about your classes, you were saying, and then we question this and we question that. And there's questions all floating all around us when we're in nature. Sometimes we have the answer. Sometimes a little experiment can bring the answer. But also in nature journaling, I think questioning itself, like the process of questioning is beneficial and beautiful. Tell me about that, about your thoughts around like questions that maybe don't have answers. It's a tough question for me because I, as like a type A Virgo, (laughs) I don't want to say OCD, but like borderline OCD, like I need (laughs) order. I need a specific, uh, you know, structure, very specific structure sometimes and routine and like all of that. I don't like that. I don't like not having the answer. (laughs) It is deeply uncomfortable. And also really, I know that it is crucial to be in that, to inhabit that space of not knowing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that is what can be scary about science and biomimicry Mm -hmm. and biology because you ask questions or you, um, you know, maybe you're doing an experiment or you're just out in nature and and you're thinking about something, but you don't have the answer and you Mm -hmm. don't know how to approach it. You get into this space of like, oh, I just, I don't know what to do. And over the years I have learned to recognize that and embrace it and <laughs> record as much as I can observe as much as yeah. I can and then let it sit and like be okay with just not knowing which again for my personality feels uncomfortable <laughs> really hard and so I am speaking to the masses here and I say I know I know what you're gonna say <laughs> you don't want to do that but it's so important and that's part of cultivating a curiosity a hundred percent like not mm-hmm. knowing just sitting with it, watching, observing, listening, tuning into our senses. And I think that's where journaling can really come into play as well, right? Like Mm. recording as much as you can, observing what you can in whatever way you enjoy doing. And then, yeah, maybe returning to it, maybe not. (laughs) Yeah, well, I found this and this maybe helps a little uh, ease that feeling that when you just put information down or you're experiencing some phenomenon out in nature and you're writing about it or drawing about it, 
you might not have the answer, but the process of questioning sort of puts a seed in your mind and the answer might come to you two years down the line and then you come across something again and then it sparks a memory of what you'd been drawing about. And then the answer happens later. Yeah, and it is so fun sometimes to return to something or have a puzzle piece missing and then find it later and be able to put that together. Um, This is not exactly the same, but I was just out hiking a couple weeks ago and saw a plant, an organism. I don't even know if it was a plant that I had no idea what it was. It looked maybe like, like, like a crustos lichen. It was on the kind of surface of the ground, but it was really spongy and looked like miniature rocks kind of stacked together. It was so weird and it was so out of my comfort zone. And I took a picture and kind of journaled a little bit about it. And then I posted to social media because that's my favorite place to go. Like, what the heck is this? Get, and get then have everyone provide their input. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of folks were saying a fungus. And I had never seen a fungus like that. So I just kind of did, like, led me down a different rabbit hole. And I, you know, read about some of these different um, fungi in, in different areas that hadn't really been recorded in this area. Anyway, it was like 10 different rabbit holes. And I, I'm pretty sure it was a fungus. And I um, identified it loosely. But yeah, it was really fun to be like, I I have no idea. And yeah. this is a cool space to be comfortable in. It's not always possible to be like stoked about it, but <laughs> I'm getting better at that. And yeah. I'm finding that it's one of my greatest joys actually just to be in mm-hmm. question. That experience that you just described reminded me when I first saw a, cu- a bird's nest fungus. I I had no idea what it was and my dad used to come around to our place and he was also just fascinated by the world he always carried uh, a a jeweler's loop yeah Uh, and he and I saw this I think I was with him and I was just like look at this what what is it I couldn't even fathom what it could possibly be it was this little cup a little it's like a fairy's bowl almost with these little silvery jewels inside and it turns out it's a fungus but I remember that feeling of just being like how did the world create this thing and what is it anyway yeah <laughs> it was a I joyful love moment. that I, I finally saw my first bird's nest fungus cup fungus um, yeah. over the holidays. I had heard of them yeah. and seen photos of them and, and mm-hmm. watched videos about them. And then I was like, "What is?" it was so small on the, on the ground in Berkeley when we were hiking. And yeah. I got right up in there. I was laying on the ground, definitely getting muddy while I was doing it. And it was so cool. It looks like a little bird's nest with like little eggs in it. It was, yeah, I was nerding out. Safe to were say. they silvery? What Do they have a silvery sheen to them? No, this one was more like a cream kind of sandy color and then the eggs wow. or like the spore the eggs whatever they were the yeah. um the spores that look like eggs were kind yeah. of like a more white off white but very neutral if i didn't yeah. know what i was looking for or was walking too fast i would not have noticed them yeah beautiful i love those moments are so exciting I- i'd love to hear you speak about well on your website you say that you're real passion is in the intersection of biomimicry and place-based experimental education. I'd love for you to talk about that and about bringing biomimicry to people who might not have come across it. I know you teach it at university level and you teach you teach nature connection to children. I'd love to hear about this, about your passion for place-based education and biomimicry coming together. Well, that's, that's, that's the nugget. If we can get people outside learning about the ecosystems that they live in in a very hands-on way, right? Where we're just Mm -mm. playing, adapting, experimenting, observing, reflecting in an area, in a specific area, you know, referencing back to field quarter. It was just so transformative being out Mm -hmm. in nature with other people who are learning about nature and natural history and, you know, practicing observation and reflection was just so, so life-changing. It shifted my whole perspective on what's important and and what I want to do and how I can make a difference in the world or even just what I want my time here in the world to look like, right? Yeah. And so I think the the place-based part of it is that let's go outside and in a place and admire it and appreciate it 
and mm-hmm. connect with it. And, you know, one of the elements of biomimicry is reconnection and the re is in parentheses because mm-hmm. the idea that we need to reconnect, that we maybe have, for most of us, been very separate from nature for the last couple hundred years. And we need to rebuild that relationship. I think that's the power in the place-based piece of it, especially in today's world where a lot of education takes place online, inside a yes. building, sitting at a desk for, you know, a couple hours at a time. The practice of going out and connecting to and being with nature is is really transformative. And I've experienced it firsthand. So many other people have experienced firsthand. And then the biomimicry piece honestly comes pretty naturally in that. Like, mm-hmm. oh, like why does the pine cone change shape? What are what are the functionalities of these things and nature? And what are some things that we are doing in our world and in the built environment and the products we make that maybe we could borrow some lessons from what's happening yes. in this ecosystem or what's happening, for example, in desert habitats where they're really conserving water and um, distributing water in a really unique way, or they have a cool mechanism for absorbing water and then storing it like the saguaro cactus. Like how can we apply that to also living in the desert? We know we are going to have to adapt to desertification and a drier, hotter planet. There's, there's so many organisms that are doing that. And I think for, for the place-based piece of it, it does come pretty naturally to make that leap. Like, this is really cool. What can we learn from it? Yeah, And that's, yeah, well, that's yeah. kind of what I'm honing right now. Like, how can we package this in a way where we get the masses, where we get a lot of people excited? Because biomimicry, while it is, I think, an inherent practice that many of us are like, oh, of course, might not have heard of the term or the methodology yet. And so the place-based nature piece gets them there. And then the biomimicry can be, okay, where, where do we go from here? Yes. Yeah. It's got a really positive spin to it because like you say, it can be solutions focused and nature's got the solution. We just have to pay attention. I'm thinking about ways that nature journalists specifically, because nature journaling is my my audience and I'm thinking well in nature journaling it's really common that people respond to three specific prompts I notice I wonder and it reminds me of and I'm thinking that probably it reminds me of is a prompt that people could use to focus on uh, for for specifically diving into biomimicry because it reminds often one of your videos shows you with a, a burr on your Uh, clothes and you said this is how velcro was created by looking at this and it reminds it can remind you of something and so maybe in terms of how people can connect through their nature journaling with biomimicry I'm wondering about your ideas on that but it comes to mind that maybe it reminds me of is a good prompt to focus on yeah and I think you know I mentioned this just previously but even just the act of nature journaling and uh, Mm -hmm. like observing how nature works, we are inherently starting to think about what are these unique adaptations? What is something weird or cool about this plant or animal or mushroom or insect? And then that kind of, I, it reminds me of, or even I wonder, like, I wonder if Mm. this would work the same if Mm. it was on clothing or that kind of thought process of taking it one step further, just Mm. I am in this place and I'm thinking about this one animal or organism, but then what, what kind of um, jumps can I make to my own experience, my own, you know, problems that I have or challenges that you're trying to solve? And I love that. It reminds me of, I would almost like probably say it inspires, right? You can mm. say it inspires mm. dot, dot, Beautiful. dot. Yeah. Yeah. Like I even when that. I was making the video about the mountain mahogany seed changing shape, and drilling itself into the ground with Mm -hmm. moisture. That made me think of like, what if we had drills or mechanisms that weren't energy powered or electricity powered, but humidity powered, moisture powered, and could change shape with moisture, you know, flex and relax and flex and relax with moisture in the same way that nature does across the board in many different strategies. And I think there are companies that are looking to that. There's a lot of folks Mm -hmm. doing biomimicry out there, but I think nature journaling And just being out in nature and connecting to nature is the starting point of it all. Because when we connect to nature and we start asking those questions, 
then we can start relating to the challenges we have or being able to tap into how incredible nature is when we are solving challenges in a different space. Uh, I'm so excited about all this. If people want to connect with you uh, and learn more about biomimicry, a great place to do that is through your podcast, Learning from Nature, the Biomimicry podcast. I think this is the only biomimicry podcast out there. Is that right? To my knowledge, which is why I started it. And I'm, I yeah. I would not have told you two and a half years ago that I was going to start a podcast, but now it's two years in. Yeah. I just reached 20,000 downloads which wow. is crazy to me That is so because cool. biomimicry, the space is relatively still pretty niche. At least that's what I thought. Um, and then, yeah, at some point I was like, no one's doing this. I have, I have the expertise, I guess. I'm definitely not an expert, but I have some of the experience and knowledge and the, the network to bring people in and interview people, which was the yes. crucial component there. And yeah, it's really taken off. It's been such a joy. And it, yeah, to my knowledge, it's still one of the only... Biomimicry specific podcast. Ooh, there's some mm-hmm. migrating geese flying overhead. I love that the that nature out your window is distracting. You. Yeah. <laughs> so joyful. It's, it's a moody sunset over the mountains where they change that beautiful <laughs> color in between gray and purple and blue, which is probably my favorite wow. color. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think there are podcasts that speak to biomimicry. Sure. The Bioneers podcast. The Native Seed Pop does a really good job of this in a um, more indigenous perspective. Um, way and I've been lucky enough to collaborate with them on the recent knowledge symbiosis series that's kind of a just conversations with indigenous leaders and scholars and biomimics and that's been a really beautiful project that Mm. I'm so honored to be a part of but yeah very very few other biomimicry podcasts that are um, out out there I know one of my friends Andrew Michael Medor also has a podcast and he does some biomimicry stuff I was an interview on his podcast more than two years ago now and I think it's (laughs) mostly based on YouTube but um, again, yeah. not by memory focused, just yeah. here and there. There's some episodes. It so must yeah, be so much fun for you to gather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And spreading that out into the world, you know, that's what you do so beautifully is you, you learn and you share. And it's that sharing piece that helps gather the people into that place of wonder, that uh, motivation to go outside and experience it for themselves. Lily, thank you so much for joining me. It's been so much fun to chat to you. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll just share one last quote from one of my favorite poets ever, Mary Oliver. And this is my life motto. And I've shared this maybe before on social media, but she writes, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And that's, yes. that's my life goal. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. And you do that so well. Thank, Thank you, you so much again. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Lily as much as I did. I was so interested in everything she had to say about biomimicry and how nature has already solved so many of the design questions that we're facing. All we have to do is to get curious and to start to see and emulate what is already around us. I loved the prompt that she suggested to think about while we're nature journaling, which is it inspires dot dot dot. I invite you to give this a try when you're next outside with your journal. Find something that grabs your attention and get curious about it. Write It Inspires at the top of your page and see where your investigations lead you. What design problem is nature solving here? What questions do you have? What thoughts come up when you spend time investigating this part of nature? I would love to hear about what you come up with. In the show notes for today's episode, you'll find links to Lily's website and podcast as well as social media links. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.